The NCAA in Michigan have come to a resolution as of yesterday on the uh, the so-called burger gate of it all. And wouldn't you know it, no, no hammers dropped. Now, of course, there's some, uh, there's still, there, while there's some celebrating from the Michigan end, they're still celebrating from the rival fans who want to pretend like there's a lot more coming. We're going to get into that as well as a couple other little tidbits on this episode of Locked On Wolverines. You are Locked On Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Wednesday. We are back and doing it. Locked On Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I am your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports and Media Group. And I was on the ground at uh, at uh, Al Glick Fieldhouse for a press conference with uh, Lou Esposito and Steve Kazula. We'll get into them uh, along with uh, in part of those tidbits uh, starting in segment two. Uh, but I was uh, there when suddenly the news dropped that the NCAA and Michigan have reached a resolution about so-called Burger Gate. So in case you're living under a rock, this is what the NCAA had to say. Michigan and five individuals who currently or previously worked for its football program have reached an agreement with NCAA enforcement staff on recruiting violations and coaching activities by non-coaching staff members that occurred within the football program and appropriate penalties for those violations. A committee on infractions panel has approved the agreement. One former coach did not participate in the agreement, a.k.a. Jim Harbaugh, and a portion of the case will be considered separately by the committee of, on infractions, after which the committee will re- release its full decision. Uh, going down below because it doesn't really, uh, I, well, I, I guess we can continue just as it is here. It says the agreed upon violations involve per- impermissible in-person recruiting contacts during a COVID-19 dead period, impermissible tryouts and the program exceeding the number of allowed countable coaches when non-coaching staff members engaged in and off the field coaching activities, so, yada, yada, yada. We know all that. Continuing way down, a couple paragraphs down, by separating these cases, the Division One Committee on Infractions publicly acknowledges the infractions case and permits the school and participating individuals to immediately begin serving their penalties while awaiting the committee's final decision on the remaining contention portion, contested portion of the case. That decision will include any findings and penalties for the former coach. This is the fourth case where the committee has used multiple resolution pass. The agreed upon penalties in this case include, this is the penalty right here, Three years of probation for the school, a fine and recruiting restrictions in alignment with the level one mitigated classification for the school. The participating individuals also agreed to a one-year show cause orders to one-year show cause orders consistent with the level two standard and level two mitigated classifications of their respective violations. Now, it has been reported that Michigan has confirmed that no, that everyone that was a level or this, everyone that would have gotten a show uh, had any penalties as that are currently on staff have been served, and anyone who uh, who else the other coaches aren't there. I mean, we're talking like Ryan Osborne, um, who's over at Charlotte now. We're talking um, we're talking talking Mike McDonald, right? These were the people alleged. Uh, Sharon Moore, you know, was uh, given a one game suspension due to his minor role in this whole thing. So it's, uh, that's why you didn't see him in week one last year. So that's all said and done. Uh, certainly not the hammer dropping. Uh, you've got, uh, I, I know I've had Buckeye fans tell me, don't even give mention to Buckeye Scoop, but you've got Buckeye Scoop saying, well, what's going to happen is, is they're going to be, they're under probation, then the next stuff's going to come and they're going to be considered repeat offenders. No, that's, that's not how that works, right? Like you're under probation. Let's say they did decide that like they don't have any evidence right now, but if they did have some evidence uh, and feel like they, I should say they don't have evidence of what they, what they set out to investigate the systemic level of the counter stallion scheme, uh, because it isn't a systemic level. It was individualized, right? That you have to keep in mind is these people screech on Twitter. It, they, they believe it goes far beyond Connor and it does not. Um, and then, so you've got people like Buckeye scoop out there who's saying things like they're, they're under probation. And then the NCAA is going to come and say, repeat offenders, because you broke that probation that was set on April 16th, 2024 for something that 
has been essentially resolved since October 2023. Okay? It's not going to happen. Number one, (laughs) that's not going to happen. Number two, for all of those who are kind of like awaiting some kind of judgment here, like, oh, okay, this, this one's out of the way. It's time for the other one. Michigan hasn't even gotten a notice of allegations for the Connor Stallions thing. In an expedited investigation, no less. This one here was not an expedited investigation. The Connor Stallions one is an expedited investigation, right? So uh, don't hold your breath if you're a rival fan. I, I understand that that upsets your worldview. Worldview is destiny, and you believe things uh, as, uh, as you believe them, and you think that I'm just speaking out of both sides when that's just not the case. Now, I also acknowledge that doesn't mean the NCAA can't come down on Michigan down the line, right? Just because obviously we saw it happen with Jim Harbaugh. They had Big Ten even said, we have no evidence that Jim Harbaugh has anything to do with this, but as the head coach of the school, he is responsible. But when you remove the element of Jim Harbaugh and he's already served you know, a little bit of things, right? Like that, that was all the talk. They want to pin Jim Harbaugh's tail to the donkey. And without Jim Harbaugh, they can't really do that. So there is uh, then that, that's kind of why this, this is separated as well, right? We're look, we're looking at the separation of things here. So um, with that in mind, I know there are a lot of people who say, they say Michigan threw Jim Harbaugh under the bus and all of this. And, you know, certainly, you know, there's people I admire and respect who are out there saying that uh, people I have some relationships with, whether they're, you know, very skin level or even a little bit deeper uh, that are whining about it. Um, and I, I don't say whining is like a pejorative. I'm just saying that they're, that's what they're doing. And, you know, talking about Michigan, not having a backbone or a spine and all this stuff. And to that, I say, what do you really expect Michigan to do? Because if it was actually a pretty good tactical decision to convince the NCAA, Hey, Jim Harbaugh, isn't here anymore. It's not like Jim Harbaugh is going to go coach with the Chargers for a year and then Michigan's going to bring him back. That's just not happening. The chances are he's probably not coaching at the college level ever again, right? So it's it's one of those things where if you are if you are Michigan and you can be like, all right, you really want to nail this guy, separate him from this, and let us have our future without <laughs> any kind of extra repercussion that you might have given him. I think that's fair. And I think that's a good tactical move. And I know that there's a lot of people that don't like that, but like, like, liken it to this way. Um, this, I'm I'm trying to come up with an analogy on the fly and it's not a good one. You're hanging out with a buddy and your buddy does something he doesn't know is you that neither of you know is against the law, but it's questionable. And, um, and they really want to get your buddy, but they're trying to get you and your buddy and maybe like some of their, of your friends that like your group of friends. And then finally they, the, you know, Johnny law says, you know what? We, we, we are deeming that the, the, while you guys were a part of it, we're going to give you guys a slap on the wrist, but we're going to go after your buddy. Who's also going to get a slap on the wrist, but a little bit more of one. Right. Like, do you really feel like you and your friends that weren't with that, that weren't the responsible ones. Again, I'm not even saying Jim Harbaugh was responsible. I'm just saying this was, this is, like I said, is a bad analogy. Like, he's more responsible as the head coach, and he's the one that they're saying misled investigators. You really want Michigan to take on whatever penalty that they were going to give to him and are going to give to him? Are you insane? And I understand there's probably a loyalty aspect that Jim Harbaugh doesn't like. Maybe this happened in January, like the discussions happened in January. I don't know. Before he took the the Chargers job. Um, But nonetheless, I think at this juncture in April, with when this is being released, right? Like clearly it wasn't fully decided upon in January. Fine. It's fair. Punish the, the, the college... Uh, the overseer in college punish the guy that's not in college, okay, and leave and leave the college itself alone. I think that's fine. It's fair, and I think it's a good tactical move, to be honest. So uh, let's let's continue on this thought. So I clearly am not done, and then we will get to the the Lou Esposito, Steve Kazula. We'll get to uh, a really important visitor that's coming to Ann Arbor tomorrow. 
Uh, and uh, and also Michigan losing uh, yet another player to the transfer portal. Uh, this time it's a scholarship player, but it's not like a high-end scholarship player. Let's get to all of that here in just a moment. But before we do, listen, we've all been there. Either as a player or as a fan, it's halftime and the scoreboard, it's not looking good. You're feeling low. You're not sure if you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you've got to dig deep. Lift up your head and say to yourself, time to get back in the game and pull off some bank heists. Take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. See, you thought I was talking about football. I'm not. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go that lets you compete with your friends and get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball and charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and tournaments and to get extra rewards to climb the leaderboard. Uh, I got to tell you, I love Monopoly. It's one of my favorite things. And uh, yeah, so I highly recommend to get out there, put on your game face, download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. All right, a couple things here real quick. Number one, thanks for everyone who said uh, stuff about my back. I'm probably about 90 to 95% better now than I was. Um, and Monday, I was I was about the same. I still have some soreness in my... It's, it's pain emanating from my lower hip uh, that is radiating into my back and locking it up. But uh, I was better. Yeah, I didn't do a show yesterday just because of poor time management because I forgot, <laughs> literally forgot. That um, for my mom's birthday, I bought her tickets to go see Joe Satriani and Steve Vai, uh, which is funny because like I, I was the Joe Satriani, Steve Vai fan as like a teenager. I went to G3 in, at the Palace in 1996, October 1996. Um, and uh, and it's, it's funny because now like she, she took me to see him in uh, like 2005-ish at... Uh, in, at, he played weirdly at the, uh, not the State Theater, what is it, the Michigan Theater in Ann Arbor. And she's like, I didn't know a single song he played, and now she knew every single song Joe played, and I only I knew all but two. No, like, great, he played the hits. That's why we didn't have a show. And so why I say that is I had proclaimed on Twitter, because uh, I'm asking for your Twitter questions uh, for the mailbag, which we will do tomorrow, uh, I was... Um, I, I, my, my plan was to double up today and I decided that I'm not doing that now. So we're doing this today and uh, this, this episode, we're going to do the mailbag tomorrow in the second episode I was going to do, which is the defensive death chart. We're going to do that on Friday because we're going to do, I just realized like I have to do, I absolutely have to do a spring game, uh, episode following the spring game after I get home on Saturday evening. So that is the plan for the week. Um, so uh, I want to keep going on this. Uh, that, that, this is why I don't al always set the exact uh, formula at the beginning of the show for what we're going to talk about, because sometimes I, I, I get through so long and realize I've got a lot more to say on a topic, right? So we pivot, much like uh, Ross with the couch. We pivot. And um, I, I feel like it is also worth discussing just the not just the rival uh outlook here because obviously this was what michigan fans have kind of been saying was bound to happen one way or the other now obviously in uh august last year it didn't really feel that way because jim harbaugh was still the head coach and uh you know you, you're looking at uh the suspension right the that the news that dropped uh, the day before the Big Ten uh, media days, uh, literally as I got in the car to go uh, down to Indianapolis was when that hit. So you had that. You had, um, it, and uh, that was, it, for, you have a lot of revisionist history of Buckeye fans now saying, <laughs> particularly Buckeye fans. I, I'm not sing, even singling out Michigan State fans. because I, I, Maybe I'm just not hearing them. I feel like, you know, the last couple of years has tuned them out a bit. But uh the Buckeye fans are the louder, louder group now, uh, which has not always been the case. But 
they they were were saying the hammer was going to drop, and, and this is before all the Connor Stallion stuff hit, right? So, um, it's certainly. Uh, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just racking my brain here. Certainly, this is not how they expected things to go in that time. Now, they try to revise history and say none of us were saying that at that time. And some people have come with receipts and have said, like, yeah, you were saying it. Um, but this is the, the I want to say the best case scenario for Michigan, but I mean, three years probation. Because Michigan's not going to do anything that essentially is going to get it in trouble. You could have a rogue actor. We've learned that. We've learned that lesson. But generally, institutionally, it's going to keep things above board as much as people want to say that it's not. Certainly, Michigan has its other issues, looking at uh, Greg Scruggs and Denard Robinson here. But uh, nonetheless, Michigan is going to do what it's always done and try to play above board. There, there's no question, as much as people, rival fans in particular, Want to make it like, well, Michigan's just like the rest of us and everything like that. That's just not the case. And I'm not, and, and, and I say that also noting that it's to Michigan's own detriment quite often that it is that way, right? It, because it, it plays this, like to this superior moral standard, whereas others might, I'm not saying that others are immoral, but like when you look at NIL being the, you know, the wild west, it's like, Hey, you can do exactly this. You're not going to get in trouble for doing it. And I understand that's not exactly a good moral standard, right? If everyone else is jumping off a cliff, but everyone else is doing it. The NCAA is not just going to be like, guess what? Everyone is punished. That's just not going to happen. And yet Michigan had continued to be slow footed and continues to do the transformational, not transactional when it comes to the NIL, right? Now, certainly the NCAA is cracked, is starting to kind of look into some programs that went all in like Miami, the Jaden Rashada thing. I don't actually I think it was Florida that got in trouble for that, not Miami. Um, but nonetheless, Michigan is it, it is holding itself to a different standard than everyone else. So um, I, I don't expect probation to be much of an issue, to be honest, no matter how much uh, Kirk Barton wants to pretend like it will be. I know I'm platforming someone that shouldn't be discussed, but He's the first name that comes to mind. He's certainly not the only one. Um, there's all kinds of people that I see that, uh, that come up on my Twitter for you. Shout out to, to Lindsay and some of those others that just end up on my feed constantly talking about all of this. But uh, as for now, the issue is resolved, which is great news for Michigan. Uh, it's, I'm curious of what the recruiting hit is. Part of it, I feel like, had to do with signing day that they accepted this penalty before because signing day, the original early signing day, you'll know Michigan did not tweet out like, Hey, we signed this guy made it really not fun for all of us who covered the team. Cause we had to wait to see when the kid themselves had posted, Hey, I signed. And then on actual signing day in February, then Michigan posted everything. So uh, clearly it was, it had some kind of prohibition there. And, uh, at the moment, I don't know if there's anything else. I doubt there's going to be a massive loss of scholarships, but uh, at this juncture, it is closed, and it's just going to be funny to watch. Uh, although I just, I, I'm, I'm a non-confrontational person in general. I just kind of want all of the talk to go away and focus on what's important, which is on the field. And I know a lot of, again, rival fans that watch this show, listen to this show, are going to say, "But where were you when?" When Tatgate happened, and I'll tell you, I was in Los Angeles, California, working at United Talent Agency, and I was making fun of Ohio State for all the Tatgate stuff. But since I've been doing this professionally, I've also told you, uh, yeah, they shouldn't have gotten punished the way they did. I mean, also, it wasn't the tattoos. It was the misleading of the tattoos by Jim Trestle, which is what Jim Harbaugh got in trouble for here. And we'll find out what his punishment is. But all right, just to summarize, uh, I think that that's fair what Michigan is doing uh, in terms of, uh, and the NCAA is doing rather, in separating this. If Michigan negotiated that, I think that's fine and fair. Jim Harbaugh's not going to be here. Okay, well, you can punish him separately. We'll take our, our punishment, out, you know, otherwise. Fine, fair, good. Anyone who's like, oh, but you threw Harbaugh under the bus. Who, at, at this point, who cares? He's not coming back, right? It's the Schroen Moore. You're hanging on. Let go. <laughs> the words of Kyler, Kylo Ren. 
we're really reference heavy today. All right, we're going to continue on. I want to talk a little bit about um, Lou Esposito, Steve Kazula uh, from their press conference uh, and get to a couple of things. So this is like some quick hitters coming up next. And we're going to do that here in just a moment. Before we do, let's get straight to the point. You want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising cost of inflation to pay off your debt or your mortgage, pretty much anything standing in the way of you and financial freedom, right? With Yahoo Finance, you can get access to the news, data, tools, all, everything you need in order to help reach that financial freedom. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or are looking for that extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and the data you need in all in one place. They're the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial uh, perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, and customizable charts, a heck of a lot more as well. So securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors and it's how Yahoo Finance ensures that you have the insight to look at all of your wealth in its entirety. And with a community over 90 million users each month, their real strength is helping you find your way to financial success. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com. They're the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. All right, we had the great pleasure yesterday of, uh, we never really met Steve Kazula. I never met Steve Kazula. Obviously, I knew who he was uh, from his time as an analyst, but I had never met him. That, and that's not always true. Like, I meet some analysts and uh, and everything. My Like, you know, Latroy Lewis is my boy. Uh, his uh, He played at Tennessee with my realtor who sold me the house that I'm currently sitting in. Um, shout out to Danny O'Brien, former Tennessee Vol. Uh but uh, I, I tend to know some analysts here and there, but uh, I never I knew of Steve Kazula. I didn't even know what he looked like in the, the three years that he was in Ann Arbor. I was on the sidelines with him for two, and and because in 2020 I was up in the box, but um, I never even knew what he looked like. But we met him. We met Lou Esposito, who it, it's always fun. I always feel like the most fun coaches we've had over the years are from New Jersey. Chris Partridge, Anthony Campanelli, or even just New England, right? Like, or like the East Coast, I should say, not New England, but like Don Brown, obviously. I remember feeling a lot of trepidation when Don Brown was coming in. I'm like, what's this guy going to be like? And then you, you have one press conference and you're like, oh, he's a blast. Anthony Campanelli comes in as linebackers coach in 2019. What's this guy going to be like? He's a blast. Lou Esposito, been on the job for two and a half weeks, comes in. We meet with him. Like, oh, this guy's a blast. So good. Um, so, uh, he he had some uh, some interesting things to say. Obviously, he's really happy with his group. It, I mean, it's a wonderful group to partake in. I thought the coolest thing between uh, between both is that we got both those guys and their best friends. Right? They they coached. This is a third stop together. Lou Esposito uh, and uh, and him were at West and Steve Kazula were at Western Michigan together. Uh, Kazula started off as a GA and then got to be a uh, the tight ends coach there while Esposito was the defensive line coach. And then Esposito gets hired to uh, be the head coach of Davenport and its first uh, its first staff. He hires uh, Steve Kazula to uh, to work there, and now they're uh, they're back together. Um, kind of funny. Neither are from Michigan. Both have spent the majority of their careers in the state of Michigan at multiple different stops. Both were at Ferris State, just not at the same time. Uh, but uh, th all that aside, I didn't really have many really big takeaways from Kasula, except for that, you know, Colston Loveland is an absolute beast. Okay, yeah, we knew that. But uh, with Esposito, it was like, okay, what's going to be, who are going to be those guys behind? And he said a name that I haven't really heard yet, and that's Ike Wana. he said, has really come along. Uh, obviously, he said Eno Etta, and he said the great thing about Eno Etta moving him inside and outside, and the fact that they're using him as kind of a chess piece, is... Uh, He's gotten better on the outside because of what he's learning how to do on the inside. Hand placement, using your explosiveness in a, in a different way. He said, you know, when, you, when you're out wide, it's kind of ready, set, go, as Don Brown used to say. But uh, you, it's, you're in much closer quarters in, uh, when you're playing inside, and that's helped him with his explosiveness outside as well. Uh, I asked him about Trey Pierce because we haven't really heard anything about Trey Pierce. 
And he said he's been a little banged up, but he he's he's been doing really good and mostly just kind of the thing that's been impressive is that he's like meeting with Esposito like every other day, picking his brain, doing all that kind of stuff. So that's good. Speaking of the defensive line, uh, of all the positions that Michigan needs in the transfer portal, uh, the only one that I've seen that is like a public declaration of Michigan offered is a defensive tackle. Uh, although when I look at his stats and his offer sheet, I'm all about this guy. CJ West from Kent state had, uh, seven tackles for loss, led the, it was the sixth on the team in tackling had two sacks, led his team in tackles for loss and sacks from the defensive tackle position has offers from Texas A&M, Arkansas, uh, at Wisconsin. I'm missing a really big school. LSU is the one that I was thinking of there. He's got some really big offers. And uh, and Michigan offered him today, and I'm like, you know what? You can get him in. Just keep making that line a crazy strength because you can rotate. And beyond the starting two and assuming assuming that Rayshon Benny is better and everything, and, and you're going to have at least Eno Etta, and we'll see about Ikawana and Trey Pierce, then cool, that will work out really well. So I hope, I hope that Michigan really pushes for him in that term because it just seems like – he could be a great addition. Uh, went to the same high school as J.J. McCarthy and Tyler Morris, Nazareth Academy. So uh, I think that's exciting. Uh, but you want to see them target wide receiver and a receiver that we mentioned. Uh, granted, he's dabbled at, at defensive back, but he was listed on the spring uh, roster as a wide receiver again. Christian Dixon, out, transfer portal. They, that means they have, I, I'm, I'm not sure if Peyton O'Leary is a uh, scholarship right now, so I'm going to assume he's not. Um, because you know, they can do that year. They can do it year by year, uh, with the, uh, walk-ons, right? It's not just like a four-year scholarship when you, like when you come in, but they have got three scholarship receivers now because Christian Dixon, uh, who it's kind of sad that his career has turned out the way it has because he was a four-star from modern day. He was fast, not quite as fast as Xavier Worthy, but like, I remember writing that, uh, I remember exactly where I was sitting when I wrote his commitment article and being like, this is a very fast guy. Jim Harbaugh last fall was like the one receiver who's really taken a big step forward is Christian Dixon, and he's gone. So didn't matriculate. The room gets smaller. They need receivers in the worst way. And I understand they're not going to be Ohio State. You still need them. You still need receivers. You absolutely do. So there's the, that. Uh, let's get on the last portion here, and that's uh, the number one running back in the country in 2026, Savian Hyder, is visiting Michigan tomorrow. That's the Tony Alford effect. Again, remember, Ohio State fans want, want you to think that Tony Alford can't recruit. Um, and, uh, I mean, he's got to close the deal, of course. Uh, but uh, to, that he was not even offered before Alford got here. And uh, he had that Ohio State offer. So now Michigan is certainly in it with him enough where he's making an unofficial visit tomorrow midweek. So it, that's exciting uh, that Michigan is pushing for a guy of his caliber uh, out of uh, Virginia. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's some big news. We'll see what that pays dividends. Man, they got to get some commitments here. I'm not saying they need a bunch, but to have three at this juncture is not great. It reminds me, granted, it ended up being okay. It reminds me of like the, uh, the 2019 class. It just, it, it felt like it, you know, they had Chris Hinton, and then they, they had the one guy who ended up leaving, going to Stanford. They just felt like they, they had like two, three guys forever. Um, and uh, yeah, it feels like they need to figure something out here soon. But got the spring game coming up on Saturday. So certainly uh, things can change in a hurry. All right, that's going to do it for us today. We will be back tomorrow with the mailbag. Get your questions in uh, on Twitter. And then Friday, we will do my defensive depth chart breakdown. And then Saturday, we will do an aftermath of the spring game. That is the plan for the week, which would bring us to five, believe it or not. So there we go. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again soon. Peace. Peace.